In my last video, I spoke a lot about JRPGs that I would recommend to someone who wasn't really into JRPGs. And after speaking to that same friend that kind of inspired me to make that video, I've also decided to make a second one because I think there are certain brands of JRPGs that are amazing games but probably not the first pick I would give to somebody who is just exploring the genre for the first time. Stick around until the end as we talk about five JRPG franchises that I would not recommend for newcomers because one of them is actually one of the biggest JRPGs out there right now and despite the fact that it's that big, I still wouldn't recommend it to somebody who was getting into the genre. I'm also kind of hoping that my mic doesn't play up in this video because it certainly did in the last one and I'm just praying that it doesn't now. But I'm going to TwitchCon Rotterdam this week and I'm hoping to look into getting a new mic there so please don't come for me when it comes to my microphone quality right now. So much like the criteria I had for the previous video, all of the games that I'm talking about on this list are readily available on modern consoles or PC or in one other case, mobile devices. So what makes a JRPG series hard to recommend? I would say that if a game requires prior knowledge of other games in the franchise, if it has overly complicated mechanics, if it has predatory mechanics, or if it has mechanics that are just very, very difficult and challenging that may ward off a potential new player, they're all eligible for this list. However, I don't think any of the games that I'm talking here are bad. I actually think that some of them are some of my favourite JRPGs. They're just not ones I would showcase to someone who'd never played one before. As a matter of fact, one of them is one of my favourite JRPGs in recent memory. So we're going to dive right in and we're going to start with a franchise that's probably going to get me in a lot of trouble just for mentioning it here. But again, I want to reiterate that I do think these games are very good. But we're going to start with the Trails series. Now, any AR JRPG enthusiast is going to tell you that the Trail series is the second coming of God. So <laughs> it's hard for me to say that it's not a franchise that I would recommend to a newcomer because people love it so much. But unfortunately, I do actually think that people's love for the franchise can sometimes go over the edge into intimidating territory. So for those of you who don't know what Kiseki or Trails is, it's a series of JRPGs of the traditional variety that are all part of the same world and the same overarching story. And there are more than 10 of these games that in order for you to fully understand what's going on in this world, you kind of have to play all of them. Now, I don't think that that's necessarily true, having done my research and having read into them a little bit more, but whenever they've been recommended to me as a JRPG enthusiast, people say to me, oh, you need to start from Trails in the Sky, which is the very first game that was released many years ago. And this series is still being released now as we're not long had Trails into Reverie, and then we're getting Trails Through Daybreak being released next month as well. If you go, oh, can I just play the newest one, Trails Through Daybreak? People will largely tell you, no, you need to go back and you need to play either the cross spell arc, which consists of Trails from Zero, Trails to Azure, and Trails into Reverie, or you need to start at the very beginning, which is intimidating to a lot of people, certainly newcomers. But from what I know, and this comes from somebody who hasn't played through all of the games, Playing through all of them as a singular series can end up being one of the single most rewarding things that you can do when it comes to the JRPG genre. However, the idea of sinking six, seven hundred hours into a series, not knowing whether you're going to like the story or the mechanics or anything like that, it's a heavy investment to ask of a newcomer to a genre they don't even know if they like yet. If it were me and I were to recommend somebody a game like Trails without telling them to invest six, seven hundred hours into a full series of games, I'd perhaps consider recommending another heavily story-driven anime-styled JRPG first. Something like Persona, Persona 5 Royal in particular, it's meaty, it's got a lot of content in it, it has that slice of life, slow burn aspect to it, without feeling like you have to literally invest a year of your life before knowing if you're going to like it or not. 
And if you are insistent on wanting people to get into the Trail series so that they can enjoy the big story payoffs that happen seemingly at the end of each game, perhaps consider breaking it up into recommending a singular game to somebody rather than going, I want you to play the entire series because this reason. Maybe recommend just Trails in the Sky or Trails into Azure first, something that somebody can grasp without thinking, oh my god, this feels huge. As I say, I actually haven't explored the Trails series very much, and I actually really want to, but I put it first on my list because it's something I've experienced personally from recommendations from others that made Trails sound like this intimidating beast that I wasn't sure I'd be able to get into. But the truth of the matter is, it is actually a franchise I really want to explore, and I do own more than half of the games in the series, and I probably should play them. I've just always been so scared of getting things wrong, or getting things in the wrong order, and as somebody who is more gameplay focused than story focused when I play my JRPGs, I'm really worried that it's not something that I would enjoy. So I think the message I want to put across from that perspective is identify what you or the person that you're recommending wants from a JRPG first. Because if it's a massive world with a lot of slow burn and big story payoffs in the end, maybe Trails is a really good recommendation. So the next franchise that I want to talk about is the Saga franchise. Now, Saga is a very cult classic series to a lot of JRPG enthusiasts, but its sheer level of difficulty and lack of direction makes it very unapproachable for newcomers. It's also a franchise that many people in the West, or at least in Europe from my experience, don't really know an awful lot about, but there have been releases for the Saga franchise for many, many years, from Romancing Saga all the way back when, one of which is actually getting remade in the future, as was shown in the recent Nintendo Direct. You also have the Saga Frontier games, Unlimited Saga, Saga Scarlet Graces, Saga Emerald Beyond, which is the most recent release, and they're all very different from one another. Some of them have been pretty successful, namely the Romancing Saga series. Others, like Unlimited Saga, are practically unplayable. This is part of why Saga is quite so hard to recommend, because where does one even start with the Saga franchise? If it were me, and there were a game I would recommend within this franchise, I would say to wait until the remake of Romancing Saga 2 comes out when it does eventually release in the future. But I'm going to take two examples of the Saga games, which are the two most recent ones, in Saga Scarlet Grace and Emerald Beyond, and explain quite why I feel that they're not great for newcomers, but are really good for people who are particularly enthusiastic about JRPG mechanics. Scarlet Grace's thing is that it doesn't meet the conventions of JRPGs as a whole. There's no towns or explorable dungeons at all. It's all pretty much done on the world map, and there's no random encounters or anything like that. And it's also really, really hard. Like, its pride is in that it's really challenging for people who love JRPGs. So there's nothing wrong with that, per se. But to try and get someone who's never played a JRPG to play a game like that, they're going to run a mile and say, oh yeah, no, this isn't for me. Kind of like Octopath Traveler in its own way, Emerald Beyond has you picking a different protagonist for a different storyline from the beginning. But it's got a wackiness to it that's quite different from any other entry in the franchise. The stories are, from what I know, pretty good. I gave up, to be honest with you. Uh, even as an enthusiast, I gave up with both Scarlet Graces and Emerald Beyond because I just couldn't figure my way out throughout the game, and I think it's very, very easy to get lost. I think that it's very easy to not understand what's going on, where to go, who to talk to, etc., because the mechanics are so far removed from other JRPGs. But hey, maybe the uniqueness of the Saga franchise is exactly what you're after. But I maintain the idea that I think that if you're going to recommend one, the remake of one of the originals that's coming in the future probably would be a really good place to start rather than the current entries in the series. Now, unlike Trails and Saga, the next entry I'm going to talk about here is actually one of my favourite games in recent memory, and it's SMT5 Vengeance. I adore this game. I think it's fantastic. I think the intricacies of the combat are really fun. 
I actually really like the way it looks. I think the characters are really distinctive visually and I really enjoy the demon mechanics and employing them into your team and how you find items and how you navigate the world map. I like pretty much everything about this game, but I still wouldn't recommend it to a newcomer. The reason for that is that it's, again, difficult. It's easier than the original Shin Megami Tensei 5, but it also suffers from that same problem I talked about in my previous video where its titling can actually be very confusing and Atlas's RPGs do tend to follow this trend. So a conversation I had with somebody not too long ago was while I was playing SMT Vengeance and somebody was asking me, oh, so what is what does it mean by Vengeance? And I was like, oh, it's a director's cut version of SMT5 and it has an entirely new story added on to the existing one but I kind of just dived into the new one rather than the original one because I'd heard it was better and then they were like oh okay so do I need to have played SMT5 first and no okay so do I have to have played SMT1234 first no and these are the kinds of conversations I think people need to bear in mind when they're talking about a newcomer to the franchises or the genre as a whole because we know what to expect from that kind of titling, whereas a lot of people actually don't. And I think it's important to be able to identify what point in a franchise you want to dive into before you actually do it. I do also think that there's a lot of mechanics going on in SMT5 and Vengeance that may be a bit difficult to digest for a newcomer. So you have so many wonderful things going on, but trying to teach somebody about fusion mechanics or essence mechanics or the items that you can use to make those demons better and the fact that your character and any other human characters are treated separately from those demons it can be a lot to handle and then obviously the combat itself is very challenging and it's very easy to just get wiped off the face of the earth within a turn that's going to be difficult for somebody new to understand what to do that being said though, SMT5 Vengeance is a game that if you can get into that and you really love the gameplay mechanics, you're probably pretty good for most JRPGs and being able to understand anything else that goes on in one. The story is quite light in SMT5 Vengeance as compared to other JRPGs, particularly other Atlas JRPGs. So again, I would perhaps push someone in the direction of Persona 5 Royal or one of the other Persona games, Persona 3 Reload of course, before letting them tackle SMT because I feel like it's a natural progression to go from one to the other. But me personally, I actually like SMT more than Persona, which a lot of people probably consider weird. So the next game I want to talk about is actually an amazing game in and of its own right, but I think that as a singular game, it needs other games to really get the most out of it. And similarly to the Trails games, you don't really want to throw a full series of games onto a newcomer. And that's Xenoblade Chronicles 3. The Xenoblade games are individually massive. So 150 hours plus, if you want to go through each one individually, you put them together, it's a long ass time you're going to be spending playing Xenoblade. And these are fantastic games. I absolutely adore all three of them. I love, even, like the second one has its fan servicey moments, but I still love it. The third one, however, I think is difficult to recommend on its own because so much of the late game ties everything together in a neat little bow that not having the context that goes with it is really detrimental to the experience at large. I also can't help but think that a lot of Xenoblade Chronicles' boss fights are a little on the less interesting side as compared to the other two games in the franchise and JRPGs as a whole. And boss fights are something that I think are really good to get people integrated into the JRPG genre because they're spectacular. They have a lot of oomph and impact when they come along. And Xenoblade 3 definitely has them, but again, they're later on in the game and trying to get someone to get through the opening sections of the game to get to that point might be difficult. Instead, luckily, you do have access to Xenoblade 1 and 2 on the Nintendo Switch already, and the definitive edition of Xenoblade Chronicles 1 is still an amazing game on its own. And if you play Xenoblade Chronicles 1 and you really enjoy it, you can then move on to Xenoblade 2 and 3. And it's a world well worth exploring, full of really amazing characters, dynamic combat, 
I do think that the real-time combat does separate itself from other traditional JRPGs, but it still feels like a traditional JRPG. And I think there's definitely a lot worth exploring. I just think that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 isn't the right place to start. Now, the final game on my list, I'm sure people probably know where I'm going to be going with this based on things I said earlier in the video, but it's going to be Honkai Star Rail. So before people come at me with their torches and pitchforks, as I'm pretty sure that they probably will, because Honkai fans are scary, there's two reasons why I don't think it's very good to recommend Honkai to a newcomer. The first of which is obvious. It's a free-to-play gacha game. And there's a level of morality that goes with recommending somebody play a free-to-play gacha. It's like going up to somebody and saying, hey, have you ever tried gambling? You might like it, and then them go off to have a gambling addiction. It just feels morally incorrect to me to recommend someone who hasn't really played JRPGs to play a gacha, even if it is one of the best ones of its kind. The other reason is there are so many mechanics, or more specifically items, that you have to kind of learn what each thing does individually, and I've personally suffered this while playing Genshin Impact, Honkai Star Rail, even Wuthering Waves, which is obviously an offshoot from those two, I found myself overwhelmed by just, oh my god, there are so many items and I don't know what any of them do because the game's not explaining them to me and there are layers upon layers upon layers of ways in which you make your character stronger that for a newcomer, it's like being crushed under the weight of it all. Yes, Honkai Star Rail does actually have some really interesting combat. It's got a conditional turn-based system similar to that of Final Fantasy X, which I praised in my previous video. It's just got so many levels to it that I feel grind against what would go well with a newcomer that I would never recommend it. And that's without it being a gacha. The fact that it is one makes me go, absolutely not. So that's the five JRPG franchises that I would not necessarily recommend to a newcomer, but I would encourage you, if you are a big fan of these franchises, to let me know whether you'd feel differently about them, or if there is a different JRPG franchise that perhaps you would not recommend to a newcomer. I know I've come across a lot of people say that they wouldn't recommend Final Fantasy because there are so many games that are different from one another that it's really hard to know where to start, so let your voice be known. And if you're not sure what to say, just type algorithm in the comments. And as you can see with these pictures, I am very much a JRPG enthusiast myself to the point where I draw these pictures by hand and I make prints of them. And I have an Etsy store that's linked in the description box below if you would like to check these out and perhaps own one for yourself. So that's all for today's video. Thank you ever so much for watching. And if you've enjoyed what you've seen here today, consider leaving a like on the video and subscribing to the channel for more JRPG videos and gaming news in general. And of course, if you'd like to support the channel further, I'd encourage you to take a look at my Patreon link in the description box below, as have all of the lovely people that you see on the screen right now. And you can come and follow me over on Twitch or Twitter, or come and join my Discord server if you'd like to chat more about JRPGs, because it's a genre I feel very strongly about, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. So let's continue the conversation over there. But for now, I shall love you and leave you with that. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.